Okay, so I'm just going to spend the next sort of 15 minutes or so telling you about a um, method which is not novel anymore uh, for pre water elimination in DTI. And specifically, I'm going to be telling you about what is the problem with it. Okay, so uh, for those of you who haven't worked with um, DTI before, so the diffusion tensor model, the IS stands for imaging. Um, is a very simple model to try and um, work out where water molecules are going in the brain as they diffuse as part of the natural diffusion process. So in the case of uh, isotropic and unrestricted diffusion, this is where we have uh, basically just water molecules moving and bouncing about following a, a, um, a, a random walk type behavior. Uh, and this would be well described by a diffusion ellipsoid, which is actually just a sphere because the sort of displacement of water molecules is identical along any possible direction in space. So we represent that pattern by a sphere. And what the diffusion tensor is, is just a matrix. And in this case, it would be a diagonal matrix. And all of the diagonal elements will actually be the same. That's the diffusion coefficient representing effectively the average area covered by uh, water molecules per um, unit time. So in a case of still isotropic but now restricted diffusion, which is what we would get if we would get some uh, uh, obstacles or barriers present, that could be some sort of macromolecule or um, cell bodies in, in, in the brain, what we will see is that the pattern of movement is still um, sort of equal along any direction in space, but now the average displacement is smaller because it's sort of restricted or constricted by those obstacles. So we still have a diffusion ellipsoid, which is a sphere, just a, a sphere with a smaller uh, radius. And again, the same thing. We still have a diffusion tensor, which is just a diagonal matrix. But now the um, uh, resulting uh, restricted diffusion coefficient is smaller than what we had before. And then we have the case of an isotropic restricted diffusion, which is when we have um, uh, barriers There are providing an obstacle to diffusion along certain directions. So for example, if we've got a coherent axonal bundle and we consider the uh, random diffusion movement of water molecules inside those axons, we can clearly see that the preferred direction of diffusion will be along the direction of the axons and diffusion uh, along a direction perpendicular to those barriers will be severely restricted. So in this case, we have clear directionality of diffusion. There is a one direction in space that is preferred and therefore the diffusion ellipsoid that represents that is going to now look like a, a, an ellipsoid um, and the uh, main axis of that ellipsoid will give us the, that preferred direction for diffusion along which the water molecules are going to be traveling further. In that case, we do have a complete diffusion tensor, which is uh, symmetrical, and each of those entries there represent the projections of diffusion onto uh, the, the, the different directions in space. So once we have fitted uh, the diffusion tensor, we can derive a number of other metrics, but the model for the diffusion tensor is actually very, very simple. So uh, S0 represents the baseline signal in the absence of any movement, and then it's an exponential model there. Um, that B there represents the B value that tells us how sensitive to uh, movement of water molecules we are. Um, and then the diffusion tensor is there, our D, and this R represents the direction in space that we are sampling. So in order to fit this model, we uh, need to get seven measurements with our MRI scanners. So one of them to give us this kind of baseline signal there um, is usually what we call the B equals zero image. So it's the one where we don't uh, have any um, sensitization to diffusion. Uh, and then we need six more so that we can get the six elements of our symmetric diffusion tensor. And those need to have a non-zero B coefficient or B value. Um, and in the case of the diffusion tensor, we only need one non-zero B value to estimate the components of the diffusion tensor. So once we have that diffusion tensor, we can derive a number of other metrics. The two most popular ones are fraction isotropy and mean diffusivity. So what fraction isotropy measures is the degree of an isotropy in uh, the movement of water molecules. So you can see, for example, here in this cartoon, uh, that where we're representing uh, both demyelination and loss in axonal density. What we see is that when we had uh, high myelinated uh, axons there and uh, quite, a, quite a high density, we had the um, movement of water molecules being very highly restricted and only happening along the, that, that direction there. So we had a high fractional isotropy. If you like, this is basically just a variance between um, the, uh, uh, that length there and the uh, radius of there. So if obviously the, 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 the bigger the difference between those, the, the higher the value of, of FA. 
And then in a case where we've lost both myelin and um, some axons, we will see that there is a slightly less um, restriction along that perpendicular direction, so the, the kind of the radius of the ellipsoid there has increased, so we have lower fracturing isotropy there. Um, and then in terms of mean diffusivity, mean diffusivity just tells us the average um, area covered by water molecules per unit time. So again, in this case, you can see that with the highly myelinated axons, it was tricky for the water molecules to move in between them, so we had very, very highly restricted diffusion and a low mean diffusivity coefficient. But if uh, there's now more space between the axons, water molecules can move a little bit more freely, and the uh, mean diffusivity will now be uh, increased in this case. So what is free water uh, elimination? So um, there are lots of limitations of diffusion tensor uh, imaging. Uh, the ones that people are usually more aware about is that it assumes a single fiber direction, so it ignores things like crossing fibers or dispersion of fibers. But another problem is that it assumes that there is no partial voluming whatsoever. Well, a lot of the time, we will have not one compartment, but multiple compartments within the size of the voxels that we're imaging, right? So they're, they're millimeter size voxels, uh, but we are trying to describe processes that are, are happening at a much, much smaller scale. So partial voluming is, is a big issue. And in particular, a lot of the time, we will also have contamination by an isotropic compartment, uh, which in, in the brain is effectively CSF. And indeed, if we do estimate the index or the proportion of free water in the brain, uh, we see obviously it's brighter in, in, in CSF and darker in brain tissues. And if we sort of zoom in there, we see, yeah, it's, it's um, dark in, in, in brain tissue, fairly bright in CSF, and then we've got along the rim there all sorts of uh, gradients of, of, of gray representing the proportion of, of, of partial voluming that is happening there. So it is important to estimate uh, the contribution of this isotropic compartment, particularly in those areas that are close to uh, CSF pockets. So in order to do that, we uh, just basically add one compartment to our diffusion tensor model. So this part here is the default or the original diffusion tensor model. And then we include a second compartment where uh, we have there a, a diffusion water coefficient um, without needing directionality because this is an isotropic component. And so F here represents the volume fraction of the anisotropic part of the diffusion, and 1 minus F will be the volume fraction of the uh, free water comp compartment. So if we uh, find F, 1 minus F will give us uh, how much of that signal is coming from free water, or uh, what is usually called the free water index. So uh, the model itself is not that much more complicated. Uh, it's just adding a little compartment to our previous model. However, this is now a two-compartment model, and because it is a two-compartment model, it will only be mathematically well-posed for multi-shell diffusion data, and multi-shell here means more than one of those non-zero B values. So for diffusion tensor, we just needed one shell, single shell. In order to properly fit this model, we're going to need at least two. However, most clinical diffusion MRI data sets are single shell, so it was important to try and find a way of fitting this model to data, even if we only have a single shell. So in 2009, such a model was proposed by uh, Pasternak, who I've just misspelled his name there, and colleagues, and in order to do this, they had to use a regularized gradient descent fitting method, um, and the regularized here stands for, there are some, some priors, there are some things that we have to, uh, to um, set, otherwise the fitting doesn't converge. And uh, <clears throat> we, this model also requires very careful initialization of the model parameters, and as I mentioned, uh, some priors need to be included, specifically the uh, mean diffusivity of the, sh the tissue, uh, which is traditionally set to 0 0.6, uh, 10 to the minus 3, uh, which is uh, what was reported in literature as a typical value uh, for uh, mean diffusivity. But the problem is this value tends to be estimated from diffusion tensor model, so there is a chance this uh, prior is, is, is not ideal, but uh, more on that in a moment. So um, for, for many years, people would come in and say, oh, but this model is well posed, you shouldn't really be using this, and that was always pushed away and ignored, and more and more applications um, started to come in. So it sort of started 
uh, with neurodegeneration. Um, it went on to uh, traumatic brain injury, to aging. So if you kind of search the literature, there are hundreds and hundreds of papers using this uh, regularized approach uh, for estimating free water. And then in uh, 2021, uh, finally, someone who was not a mathematician decided to uh, do a study to sort of show what is the problem of these regularized single shell models. So he compared a regularized gradient descent single shell model with um, a nonlinear um, least squares fitting using multi shell data, which is the kind of well posed version of the model. So here are just some examples of the images that you, um, that you can get. So obviously some of the obvious things are there. Uh, so the free water index, uh, th this value in those two options, both the single shell and the multi shell, are close to one in CSF and in the uh, surrounding uh, parenchyma. Then the um, MD, and now the T there stands for tissue. So when you extract free water, then you have the mean diffusivity of the free water compartment and the mean diffusivity of the tissue compartment. So the MDT values, uh, so we're now looking at this row here, are always lower um, uh, in the two free water approaches compared to uh, DTI. And this again makes sense because in the DTI, the CSF contribution was going straight into the mean diffusivity. Now we're separating them and we're seeing that actually the mean diffusivity of the tissue itself is much lower than um, expected. Um, and then we can also see that the single shell, the, the, the regularized gradient descent method here, provides uh, mean diffusivity maps that have lower contrast between gray and white matter. In fact, there's non-existent contrast between gray and white matter in the single shell approach, while there is more contrast in, um, uh, in the multi-shell version of those maps there. For the FA maps down here, uh, those uh, free water eliminated DTI estimates are higher than the ones uh, obtained for DTI, particularly in white matter regions. And again, this made sense because of the contamination of the free water, um, the, um, the, the, the movement of water molecules within those axons was being perceived as less anisotropic because it was uh, being averaged out with this isotropic diffusion that was going on in, in the background. So all of this makes sense. And this is in line with previous studies that had shown that uh, the uh, maps obtained with the single set shell approach are plausible, okay? And they are. So uh, another thing that they did then was to say, okay, what happens if we simulate some lesions in our brain data? And those lesions can be um, by sort of changing the free water uh, isotropic compartment, or we can change the mean diffusivity instead. So this is brain data, but they got the signal uh, from the brain data and then added either a bit of extra isotropic component in the free water or a bit of uh, extra isotropic component, but as part of the mean diffusivity. Hope hopefully that, that's making sense. So if you see here, this is the gold, um, the ground truth. And what they did was this. They just changed that bit of the tissue there and said, I'm going to increase the amount of free water in that little sphere. And it's just the free water that they're changing. Then they put all the data back together and therefore there should be nothing changing in the mean diffusivity of the tissue because all of the change went into the free water. And then here you see what the three fitting methods do. So obviously DTI has no way of estimating this as part of free water, so we put all of the change in the mean diffusivity as was to be expected. And then what does the single shell approach do? Well, it does capture the change as part of a change in free water but it's very clearly present in the MD map as well. So this model was not able to um, could fully understand, if you like, that the change was uh, free water only. And then finally, uh, the uh, multi-shell approach, there it is, the lesion in free water and nothing whatsoever in MD. Then they did the reverse, they put the, um, sort of they applied the manipulation to the tissue mean diffusivity rather than uh, the free water component. Uh, again, DTI can capture that. There it is. Um, what did uh, the uh, single shell method do? So it's picking it up as a change in free water, uh, which again is erroneous. Um, there isn't much in the mean diffusivity. There is a tiny, tiny little bit, but uh, uh, not, not a huge amount there. And it's clearly seen in the fractional isotropy map. While the uh, multi shell version finds nothing in uh, free water index in line with the ground truth, and uh, all the effect of that lesion is there in the uh, uh, mean diffusivity compartment as to be expected. So on the basis of this, 
uh, we're already starting to see some, some clear issues with the, with the single cell approach. And then finally, they also did some simulations um, uh, of, of single voxel type tissue uh, changes. And what I would like to um, uh, I would like to uh, catch your get you to catch your attention or to look at this uh, uh, graph down here in particular. Uh, so they, they're doing three initialization methods for the for the single shell approach. Uh, we can ignore those for now. The green one is the one that I'm going to use later on. Um, but the um, uh, what this graph is showing us here is that when we have our um, uh, estimates when we're uh, simulating data that has a mean diffusivity of the tissue equal to the value that was used as prior, which is this point here, so the ground truth mean diffusivity is 0.6, then the uh, single shell method behaves really well. It's right on top of the ground truth, so the, 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 the orange line there is the ground truth FA value, so everything is working really well, but as soon as the underlying uh, ground truth of the mean diffusivity, as soon as that changes, you can see that the uh, single shell approach generates a value of FA that has nothing to do with the ground truth, and in fact it increases with the true mean diffusivity of the tissue. Is that making sense? And we see that for different values of underlying free water compartment. Okay? So, if the prior is good and the prior is set to be the same everywhere in the brain, so if the prior is doing a good job, the uh, single shell method can recover ground truth, fractional isotropy, and mean diffusivity, but as soon as the underlying tissue is actually different from the prior, we start to get this correlation between fractional isotropy and mean diffusivity, which is not true. Everything was kept constant here. The only diff that difference is being introduced by the um, uh, the, 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 the regularized method, which isn't appropriate. Um, okay, so um, there are some studies looking at this um, free water in aging, and we happen to have uh, the CAMCAN data set lying around, which, hap which happens to be multi shell. So I thought, okay, let's have a look at what these things look like when we apply it to uh, um, an aging data shell with multi shell data. And I can use the two methods because I can just extract the inner shell and apply the single shell approach, and then I can use both shells to uh, look at the multi-shell approach. So lots of text coming down here just to tell you exactly what I did. So I used 620 healthy volunteers from the CAMCAN data set, uh, so age range from 18 to 88. So because we have those two shells, we can compare the free water DTI estimates using the single shell approach, just taking the B equals 1,000 inner shell data, and uh, I can compare that to the multi-shell approach with the two um, uh, sets of B values. Uh, pretty standard pre-processing. Uh, DTI modeling, uh, the kind of standard DTI modeling was um, processed in FSL, um, and then the free water elimination was uh, fitted to this data using the um, uh, regularized gradient descent and the nonlinear least squares multi shell approaches. Um, I used another, another very, very bog standard um, method for voxel wise analysis of diffusion data called TBSS, that stands for Tract Based Spatial Statistics. So I applied that to the, just <coughs> straight uh, from, the, um, from, the, from the pack pipeline to the FA data and then applied uh, the TBSS non-FA script to all of the other versions of the free water um, uh, metrics and this script basically just applies the same transformations which were applied to FA um, so we can have all of the data in the same space ready for uh, voxelized analyses and uh, the uh, stats were performed with permutation tests, 5,000 uh, permutations and correction for multiple comparisons as well. Significant correlations between age and diffusion metrics were defined by a corrected p-value of less than 0.01. Okay, so what <coughs> did I see? So widespread positive correlations between mean diffusivity and age um, has been reported many, many times. Nothing special here. And this was the case for uh, both uh, DTI and then with the two um, um, free water models there as well. However, when free water elimination was performed, the number of significant voxels decreases, and this effect is more pronounced in the single shell method. So th that's what we're looking at here. So I, I broke up the, 
uh, brain into lots of different regions using the GHU white matter atlas. That's what those regions there are. And then in blue, you've got the DTI. In orange, you've got the two versions of the um, pre-water fitting with the um, uh, darker orange being the um, uh, single shell. And what you see is that um, the orange bars are always lower than the blue. So there is a reduction in the effects of mean diffusivity with age but that's much, much more pronounced in the um, uh, single shell version. And in fact, if, you, uh, if this is big enough for you to zoom in there, in that um, red region there, the um, significant effects have completely vanished for the single shell approach. And uh, there are several regions where this happens. So in some regions of the brain, it's just as if mean diffusivity uh, has no effect whatsoever, which may be true. We don't know, but there is a clear difference between these two methods. So the free water index, um, highlighted there in green, also shows widespread positive correlations with age for both methods. But again, uh, difference in number of significant voxels, and this time we have um, more uh, significant voxels with the uh, single shell approach. So suggesting here that's perhaps overestimating the uh, free water content um, in, in this case. Um, but perhaps, not perhaps, for sure, the more interesting findings here are in FA. So the DTI-based FA produced strong negative correlations with age across the whole brain. That's there up there. Again, widely reported in the literature. Um, the free water eliminated FA maps obtained with the single shell the approach, so the regularized one that needs priors, um, are there. And you can see a very clear difference because now in the middle of the brain, there are lots of yellow regions. So that is suggesting that actually in these regions of the brain, the correlations are positive. Complete change from what we've seen before. And uh, you, if you look at the multi-shell version, those yellow correlations are not there at all. So this is not just something that slightly decreases. It's actually suggesting there's a completely different process underlying um, these changes. So um, what's going on here? Obviously, the well-posed model is the multi-shell, so uh, we can be fairly sure that it's the multi-shell one that is right and the single-shell one that is wrong, but it would be interesting to understand why. So I've got all of those little regions that I had before from the uh, JHU map, so I back-projected all of these back into subject space so I could then extract means for each metric for each ROI. So I've done quite a lot of um, com comparisons here to try and isolate the uh, issue. I'm not going to bore you with all of that. I'm just going to show you an example. So if we look at this splenium, uh, so that uh, region highlighted in red there, part of the corpus callosum, um, this was one of the regions where the single shell method finds positive correlations with age. Okay? So this is one of the cases where the methods disagree. So just some box plots looking at the um, um, average, the data across the different subjects, the mean of the metrics across the different subjects. So every red dot here is a subject. Um, and you can, you can see that the uh, single shell, which is always on the right, um, appears to have a lower value uh, for FA than the multi-shell method, although there's <coughs> quite a lot of overlap there, so maybe there isn't a huge difference. Uh, but then this graph here, when I um, look at mean diffusivity uh, across the subjects, this immediately highlights what the what part of the issue here. So a lot of the variability um, in mean diffusivity that we had is gone, and the values and estimates of mean diffusivity that we get with the single shell method are rather close to the prior that I set. And if I send, change the prior, they change up and down. So the um, uh, what this is suggesting is that the uh, single shell approach, regularized approach, is getting caught in a local minimum uh, near the um, um, initialization that was used. So this is the same thing for the free water index, and uh, as, as I suggested before, it looks like the single shell method is slightly underestimating uh, the, uh, um, the contribution of free water in the data. <coughs> Okay, so um, looking at the um, FA as a function of age now, we see exactly what we'd seen in the uh, whole brain analyses. So we've got in blue the uh, multi-shell approach and in red the single shell. And so this is exactly the same data. The difference is just a fitting. And uh, you can see that the blue line, the multi-shell, is clearly still showing that negative correlation with age as been widely reported in the literature for FA. But 
the um, uh, single shell method has now changed those, some of those values and we see that kind of positive um, uh, trend that we had also identified in the whole brain analysis. Uh, how about for MD? So this is what it looks like. So again, we really see that variability has been extremely decreased. We've got our values much, much closer to the prior which was set and the uh, rate of change with age is still there, but it appears to be flattened out. So this again, explaining what we saw in the whole brain where in some regions of the brain, the mean diffusivities um, uh, correlations have completely disappeared um, uh, for, the, for the single shell approach. So what about the single shell algorithm is doing this? <clears throat> so I looked at um, the relationship between the uh, free water FA multi shell estimates and the free water single shell FA estimates. So they're just being plotted against each other and they're color coded for age. So we, we can see, as we saw with the box plot, that the um, values of FA with the single shell method are generally lower than the ones obtained with multi shell, but you can clearly see that that trend sort of shifts as age goes on. So for the older patients in yellow, they get closer to the line and even cross the line, suggesting that the single shell starts to overestimate FA, and that is correlating with age. And you can see that here as well, if that graph doesn't make a lot of sense, in the vertical axis here is just the difference between the uh, multi-shell estimate and the single-shell estimate, and then I'm plotting that as a function of age, and then you can see that there is a clear uh, decrease with age uh, with a lot of those values uh, becoming negative, so the, the, the single-shell estimate becoming greater than the multi-shell estimate as age increases. Um, so there is a difference between them, but that difference is correlating with age, and this is why we're seeing that, uh, that difference in the, um, uh, in the FA patterns. And why is it? Well, I'm pretty sure it's that uh, issue that I highlighted initially that the uh, single shell method uh, overestimates FA as a function of mean diffusivity. So what I'm plotting here now is the mean diffusivity estimate from the multi-shell model that I'm using as the, as the ground truth in a sense because the single shell, as we know, it's all flattened out. And I'm plotting the, um, uh, the, the, the single shell uh, FA estimate as a function of that. And as you can see, it goes up linearly, which is um, exactly the same thing we had seen with those simulations. Mean diffusivity of the tissue goes up and the estimate from the single shell model for FA goes up as well. And in case you're wondering, uh, no, the same thing doesn't happen with the um, multi-shell FA. We see a, a, a decrease, potentially driven by, by, by some outliers, but a, a decrease of the um, FA with MD, which is actually what you'd expect biologically, right? So in the simulations, everything was kept constant. But if you think about that graph that I showed you initially with the uh, demyelination and the locks in axonal density, usually if FA goes down, MD goes up, because if there's less anisotropy, there is also uh, less of restriction uh, for, for movement of water. Uh, so that's it, really. So what is the trouble with free water DTI using a regularized single shell approach? So generally, free water index are underestimating uh, and the mean diffusivity is overestimated. Uh, the MDT values that we we'll obtain are rather close to the prior we used for model initialization. Uh, so this results in an apparent flattening of our MDT profiles. In many regions, it appears as MD is not changing with age at all. The uh, fractionized HP estimates increase with the underlying mean diffusivity in the tissue for the single shell approach, which in turn uh, increases with age, resulting in this false correlation. Well, the, the correlation is not false, but this false link between uh, the FA uh, of, of the tissue and age. Uh, so biological plausibility of the metrics obtained with the single cell approach does not imply accuracy or specificity, and the findings reported in the literature using such methods need to be interpreted with extreme care. So thank you very much to the people involved in this in one way or another, and obviously to the CAMCAN team for collecting all of that data. Thank you very much.